Hello everyone, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Khantausi Postman. I am a postdoctoral researcher in studies in historical trauma and transformation at uh, Stellenbosch University. I used to be a PhD student at the University of Kashmir under the supervision of Professor uh, Lily Wand. And uh, I wanted so much to come uh, for this seminar, but I couldn't for some reason. Um, and uh, so I, I, uh, the paper that I'll be presenting today is uh, titled Comedy, Memory of the People and Activism, Bohubrihi's Afterlife. Bohubrihi was a tremendously popular uh, drama serial in Bangladesh. And uh, I understand that uh, my time is limited, so I'll be presenting um, only the central argument of my paper and I'll be reading out only 2,000 words. <clears throat> Representing the traumas of history in the comedic medium is risky and something of a taboo. Com catastrophic pasts are generally very emotive. Uh, their humorous treatment may indeed be insensitive and run the risk of hurting survivors and their descendants' feelings. Still, comedy, when achieved with discretion, may generate profound understanding of the scene of trauma as well. Let me illustrate this point with an example from The Death of Stalin, a 2017 black comedy movie written and directed by Armando Yan. It is a political that with other issues, people's disappearance and imprisonment in the gulag by the thousands, virtually for no reason, mostly due to Joseph Stalin and the state's paranoia about conspiracies. The title suggests the movie is about Stalin's death and the subsequent power struggle of Central Committee members. Not long after the movie begins, Stalin has a heart attack and collapses to the floor where he is discovered the next morning. Once the members of the Central Committee decide to look for doctors to examine uh, the comatose Stalin, they find out that all the good doctors, all the good ones, have been sent to the Gulag long back. Since they have to make do with whatever they have at hand, they hunt for doctors, and a strange group of physicians is assembled, a shabby lot, some too old and retired, and others too young. Stalin's daughter, Setlena, calls them mental patients and creatures. The whole episode, the hunting and the group's interaction with Setlena, is hilariously funny, but it also communicates the absurdity of Stalinist repression and the extent to which it went. This illustrates that comedic representation does not need to be considered an unexplorable territory while speaking about the scars of history. Another reason why I believe comedy is an enormously potent form of artistic medium for the representation of trauma has to do with the kind of language com comedy speaks, the type of discourse it is. My argument is, comedy speaks a language that is fundamentally different from the language power speaks. As we all know, powerful entities, be they political, economic or whatever, create validating discourses that justify their existence, even necessity, and the horrific consequences of their absence. These discourses intend to fashion the dominant narrative of the past, taking the interest of the powerful into account in order to uh, perpetuate the structures of power. One of the most significant aspects of these, uh, of these sort of discourses may be illustrated by typical Hollywood movies, in which America acts as a guardian angel of the universe. America is a force for good and the world is better off because of Americans' sacrifices. This they tell the audience. In other words, they dramatize the old antagonism between good and evil uh, and represent themselves as, as good and others as evil. This is often done by tapping into the trope of American hero. Indeed, the glory of the nation, the sacrifices of, of its people, and their heroic spirit are a set of themes that often feature in a, top, a typical Hollywood movie. The language of this, this discourse, I would agree, is of epic form of arts, and sometimes tragic too. This language thrives on the eternal truth of the victory of the righteous 
through long struggle against the sinister force that is the other. The same goes for the discourses or meta-narratives that validate a country's uh, existence, especially of a post-conflict one. By post-conflict nation-states, I mean uh, nation-states with a founding trauma in Dominique Lacapra's terms. These nation-states emerge out of a traumatic event or process like colonial uh, oppression, war, and so on. In this sense, countries of the Indian subcontinent, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, are all post-conflict uh, nation-states, with an originary myth uh, dramatizing the antagonism between good and evil. This is nowhere more evident than in their originary myths. Take, uh, take India, for example. People's long struggle for freedom against the British colonial power who drained the country of its resources, or Bangladesh, a country that celebrates its independence from uh, Pakistan through a just liberation war where it had to make enormous sacrifices. I'm not saying that there is no truth in these originary myths. What I'm saying is these post-conflict nation states use these myths uh, as the founding narratives of their nationhood. And their justification as nation, nations take the form of epic or tragedy. These nations employ their resources in the act of making dominant stories of the past that validate their present. Post-conflict nation states are often plagued by contending forces of power. Each of these forces attempt to reconfigure the narratives of the past so as to justify its present. To this end, they need to engage in a considerable amount of memory politics, evident in Yogi Adityanath's renaming Mughal Sarai as Pandit uh, Din Doyal Upadhyaya Nagar, Allahabad as Prayagraj, and Faizabad as Ayodhya in Uttar Pradesh, India. The BJP power base is striving to reconfigure its past in order to validate its present. They are engaged in the act of waving a narrative premised on the idea of India as a nation of Hindus in origin in order to forward their Hindutta agenda. Again, the language of these narratives of the past are epic or, epic or tragic, but never comedic. Therefore, comedy can avoid speaking the language of power, even, sub uh, even subvert and undermine the narratives uh, that act as power's justification. As comedy does not conform to the discourses of power, it has the capacity to generate a provisional or subversive narrative, by which I mean a non-dominant story that suggests an aspect of historical truth about the past that is selectively glossed over by the meta-narratives. Provisionality saves this narrative from emerging as totalizing. I would draw on Humayun Ahmed's Bohubrihi to illustrate this point. I'll now recount the history of Bangladesh very briefly so as to contextualize my subsequent discussion. Bangladesh emerged as an independent nation as uh, a result of nine month long liberation war between East and West wings of Pakistan in 1971. The genocidal violence perpetrated by Pakistani army and its local collaborators resulted in 3 million deaths, 200,000 rapes, and a refugee flow of uh, 10 million people in India. Once Pakistan surrendered on uh, 16 December 1971, 93,000 members of Pakistani army were given safe passage to their country in conformity with Geneva Convention. However, Bangladesh government uh, started the process of trying the local co collaborators in 1973, but this stopped because of Prime Minister Sheikh Mujib and his family's killing in 1975. The country was essentially ruled by pro-Pakistani uh, military regimes from 1975 till 1990. After the return of democracy in 1990, uh, popular demands for trying the collaborators were raised through movements in 1992 and 2012. 
Many of these collaborators were tried and some given death sentences since 2013. Before entering into a discussion on the drama serial, I would like you to consider the social and political contexts in which it appeared. It was aired towards the end of the Irshad regime in uh, uh, 1989. Irshad was one of the uh, military dictators. After the brutal murder of the Muji family in 1975, there was an informal ban on discussion on certain topics of the liberation war. The name of Sheikh Mujib, under whose leadership Bangladesh was born as an independent nation, was not to be pronounced in the public media. The Pakistani military would only be mentioned as marauders and the indefinite and ghostly they. The school textbooks of, this time, of those times would testify to this particular kind of language use. This was done in an effort to shape a dominant narrative where the contribution of Sheikh Mujib is erased and the description of atrocities of Pakistani military and its local collaborators downplayed. This narrative was to reconfigure the past in a way that justified the regime's present. In a political climate like this, Bohubrihi's dealing with the liberation war was no mean fit. It was obviously an act of defiance and nonconformity on the part of the director and screenplay writer to speak about the freedom struggle in a political environment that took issues with it. The spirit of defiance looks even greater when it is considered that the serial was aired on the state TV channel that was dubbed the box of Mr, Mrs and servants, meaning that it would only be telecasting things that sang praises of General Irshad, his wife and the ministers respectively. It was a time when there was only one television channel in Bangladesh, BTV or Bangladesh Television. It had a great impact on the human development of Bangladesh through its campaigns for vaccination and education or against child marriage. This evidences the significant influence BTV exerted on the social life of Bangladeshi people. Bohubrihi used to be aired every alternate week. And in between two episodes, people would engage in discussions about it in informal social settings. It became a topic over which social bondings could be cemented. Funny dialogues were imitated for laughter and references were made to Bohubrihi during conversation as it became a common experience everyone had and could relate to. In other words, it became an indispensable part of the social life. It was, also, uh, it, it was also covered widely by print media, so interviews of the director, screenplay writer and actors would appear regularly in the print media. It may sound unbelievable today that the doctors of the country staged a protest against the supposedly unflattering portrayal of a young doctor who was extremely nervous and, would, uh, and consequently would do blunder after blunder. This testifies to the fact that Bohubrihi became a national phenomenon. It is not only, uh, it is not even going to be uh, an overstatement to say that it was one of the factors that culturally unified the country at that particular moment in Bangladeshi history, as it cut across classes, genders, and other such divisions. The serial ran for uh, a total of 26 episodes and lasted for approximately a, a year as it was uh, aired every two weeks. The year-long intense engagement with the serial made its uh, characters household names and the events extremely familiar. As a result, its cultural consequences were considerable. Most importantly, it became a memory, a prosthetic one, in Alison Landberg's terms. A prosthetic memory is a memory that, uh, memory of the screen, not a memory of oneself. So it became a memory, a prosthetic one in Alison Land Landberg's terms and uh, that traveled across generations and survives even today. For instance, a dialogue of the serial, Tui Rajakar, or You Are the Collaborator, is still used to talk about those Bangladeshis who collaborated with Pakistani military in killings, rapes, and massacres. In Bohubrihi, this dialogue is taught to three parrots, uh, and which, which are supposed to be gifted 
to collaborators so as to plague them mentally. Two of them eventually dies, but one survives and learns the dialogue. It is possible to take this symbolically as the colors of, the, of a parrot, the green of its plume and uh, re the red of its beak are also the colors of Bangladeshi flag. The parrot in, a, in the cage, therefore, may stand for the powerless Bangladeshi people. As much as it is powerless and caged, the parrot still voices its rebellion in the face of power's repressive instrument, instruments by bluntly asserting you are the collaborator. This was the first time in, he, uh, in many years that collaborators were condemned on national television. This condemnation entered the social space due to Bohubrihi's popularity as a, a comedy and has traveled across generations as evident by its cultural afterlife. This dialogue has been etched so permanently in the collective, collective consciousness of Bangladeshi people that both during the mock trial of the collaborator by, collaborators by the Committee for Eradication of Perpetrators and Collaborators in 1992 uh, and the movement for death sentence to collaborators by, by public awakening movement, popularly known as Ganu Jagurun Moncho in 2012, Tui Rajakar was used as a slogan. The, represent the reper repercussions of such cultural inscription for an individual should reveal the serial's impact in the intergenerational cultural memory. While I was working on this article, I had to rewatch the entire serial a few times and I was surprised how, at how much of it I remembered. I remembered the uh, events of Bohubrihi just as well as I remembered my real experiences of childhood. I was a six-year-old kid of Standard 1 when it was uh, aired, and I already participated in the cultural phenomenon Bohubrihi generated. Even though my mom memory was a little out of focus, to quote Agha Shahidali, before I watched it recently, I was mostly right in my memory about the events. This, in my opinion, happened because of, the, because of two main reasons. First. I belong to a community that experienced the serial culturally. And secondly, the comedic representat representation of trauma in Bohubrihi imparted the demand for justice without transmitting it its violence by engaging the audience for vicarious witnessing. The bloggers at the forefront of the public awakening platform were more or less the same age group as me at the time Bohubrihi was aired. They grew up experiences the same things uh, I experienced. Military regimes, uh, movement for democracy, its struggle in taking root in Bangladesh, political violence, the alliance of major political parties with formal, former collaborators, some of whom were made ministers, persecution of minority population, etc. These are the experiences we grew up with. When the court gave a sentence of, for life imprisonment to Kader, Abdul Qadir Mullah, who was one of the most notorious collaborators, people took to streets demanding his and all other collaborators' death sentence being led by some bloggers. The movement spread like wildfire to every corner of the country, even worldwide, wherever Bangladeshis lived. And the government ultimately revised the law so that Abdul Qadir Mullah's sentence could be reviewed. He and a few other collaborators after him were tried and given death sentences later. The use of Tui Rajakar, or here the collaborator, during this movement implies that people could be mobilized with this slogan. This in turn suggests a strong afterlife for Bohubrihi in people's memory. My argument is that the drama serial generated a subversive memory in the collective consciousness of Bangladeshi people through the use of comedic medium that could be reactivated later for the purpose of activism, both during the movement of the movements of the committee, committee for Eradication of Perpetrators and Collaborators and Public Awakening Platform. I'll end here. If you have any questions, suggestions, uh, and comments about my uh, presentation, uh, uh, please uh, direct them to uh, 
khantoshiposman at gmail.com khantoshiposman is my name you can see the spelling in the brochure and you uh, all in lowercase khantoshiposman at gmail.com thank you so much uh, thank you